Welcome to episode 45 of 100 Years of Marine Corps Tankers, a channel that was created as a way to honor the lineage and history of the United States Marine Corps armor community. Through these interviews, the stories of Marine Tankers will remain the test of time and will not be forgotten. This week, the channel is proud to host a Marine officer whose career spans 30 years and four deployments in two theaters, starting with the Yellow Footprints of the Marine Corps Recruit Depot in San Diego, and currently finds itself in Camp Fuji. It is my honor to introduce the commanding officer of the Combined Arms Training Center, Camp Fuji, Colonel Robert J. Boders, Jr. Welcome to the channel, sir. Hey, thank you, Jared. Appreciate it. And uh, definitely an honor to be here with you today. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, normally, I would ask why somebody became a Marine, but uh, after reading your bio, sir, and, and seeing that you're a second generation Marine who was born and raised in Texas, I think that question is kind of self-evident. So we'll, uh, <laughs> we'll move we'll move past that question and ask you the next one. Um, after you uh, uh, enlisted as a rifleman uh, and, did, and five years later attained your degree from Texas A&M um, and your commission shortly after that, did you know that you wanted to be a tank officer? Uh, yeah, uh, definitely going through TBS. Uh, I knew I wanted to be a tanker and uh, it was my first choice. Uh, infantry was a very distant second, uh, but really I was definitely all in for, uh, for going into the tank community. Did you learn quickly to have your weapon carry you rather than carry your weapon? <laughs> yeah, that's definitely one of the benefits, right? <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> and then from post TBS, uh, you, you uh, first checked into the first tank battalion and quickly rose uh, from platoon commander to executive officer of company C. Uh, what are some of your memories from, from back in this time, sir? Uh, well, um, you know, getting to 1st Tank Battalion, uh, that's when I realized right off the bat, the tank community was a very competitive com community. So uh, whether it was between uh, tank crews, tank platoons, and tank companies uh, on the enlisted side, on the officer side, just something about uh, being in the tank community right off the bat was something I saw was just the the sheer competitiveness. And, uh, and I would see that, you know, throughout all my times uh, in a tank battalion, but that's definitely something that struck me right off the bat. And, so, uh, and, and it was a, uh, it was a good experience and, and it was something, you know, it, it just that phrase iron sharpening iron kind of comes to mind. And looking at your resume here, sir, it, it was interesting because there was a term on there that I'd never heard before. Um, it seems like your career took a very interesting pathway after those first two years at first tanks, where uh, it says you were selected to serve as an intelligence officer as part of what is a supplemental military occupational specialty program. Uh, what is that, sir? Can you explain that? Yeah, so back in the uh, the 90s, uh, the Marine Corps had a, a huge shortfall for intelligence officers and, and logistics officers and a few other uh, high demand, low density MOSs. Uh, and so as part of an enticement program, they offered what was called a supplemental military occupational specialty program in which combat arms officers, in, primarily infantry, uh, armor and artillery officers, uh, could do one of those short MOSs in lieu of a B billet. So, you know, instead of, you know, going to the drill field or recruiting tour, uh, you could stay in the operational forces in one of those MOSs. So I was selected, I, I uh, applied for the intelligence MOS and got selected for it. And uh, as soon as I was done with my XO tour at first tanks, um, I got sent to Dam Neck, Virginia Beach for the uh, MAGTAP intelligence officer course. And I got the 0202 MOS. That's incredible, sir. I mean, uh, just just those two those two MOSs combined. I mean, that's a that's a lethality in, in the making. Um, and not to mention, you, after that, you went to weapons and tactics instructor course in Yuma, uh, and then it just kind of led into the, the the deployment that you made uh, as the operations planner uh, for the U.S. CENTCOM uh, Coalition's Force Land Land Component Command, uh, which was in support of uh, Operation Enduring Freedom. And these were the early years. This was two thousand one, two thousand two. So, what was Afghanistan like in these early years, sir? So, um, you know, right after 9-11, I was actually in Okinawa when 9-11 kicked off. And uh, uh, within two or three months of 9-11, I, I was on a plane with five other Marines from Okinawa. All of us were intelligence-related uh, Marines in, in the intelligence-related uh, fields. Uh, and then we joined the Sea Flick. And, uh, yeah, so Afghanistan back then uh, was really a special forces kind of show uh, up until, uh, as we know, Task Force 58 was formed and under General Mattis's leadership. Uh, you know, conducted that uh, long range uh, amphibious assault into uh, what was uh, at first fought Rhino. Mm -hmm. uh, and then eventually they took uh, Kandahar Airfield. And then from there, uh, 10th Mountain Division and all the other following forces uh, kind of came in after uh, Task Force 58 uh, seized the ground. Yes, sir. I mean, that's, that's incredible that early that on uh, you were out there. I can only imagine what, you know, having gone back there and seen it how many years later, I mean, it's absolute change and uh, very, very impressive, sir. 
it seems like, uh, uh, as it always happens, uh, they, we swapped close at some point during our career. And that happened to you when you uh, graduated from Marine Corps Expeditionary Warfighting School in 04. Uh, this time, they, you, know, you returned, you came back to 2nd Tank Battalion. That's and right. it was here that you deployed to Fallujah, Iraq, this time in Operation uh, Phantom Fury. And sir, we've already had a lot of warriors from Phantom Fury come on the channel, but uh, uh, certainly have not had a company commander of Charlie Company come on. So, sir, as as the, as the company commander for Charlie Company during what is really a modern day, um, you know, very impressive battle and, and and operation that we executed as a tank battalion, you know, can can you kind of just start from the beginning, sir, and, and walk us through it? Yeah, sure. So, um, you know, as you said, I graduated EWS, and and I was fortunate that the Marine Corps held up to their end of the deal and sent me back to my uh, primary MOS tanks. Uh, so getting uh, to second tank battalion, I think I uh, got, I uh, got to Camp Lejeune in late June uh, and turned over with Captain Ron Storer who had the company before me. And uh, by July, uh, you know, we were already in SR-10 and I'd been off the tank for four and a half years, you know, hadn't, hadn't been an intelligence officer. Uh, and I inherited a very, uh, very experienced, very salty company, uh, incredible platoon sergeants, uh, as you know, uh, you know, Gunnery Sergeant Hillard, Gunnery Sergeant Cast Castillo, and of course, Gunnery Sergeant Jules, uh, three tremendous platoon commanders, uh, Lieutenant Cash, Lieutenant Buffamonte, uh, Lieutenant Odame, and of course, my, my uh, XO, uh, Lieutenant Smithley. So it was a pretty uh, intimidating uh, kind of feeling walking into a company like that. Um, uh, you know, all, most of the NCOs and the gunners were also, you know, combat season from uh, the first OIF. Uh, and, you know, getting getting down to Charlie company, um, we were actually uh, not the primary company uh, mobilized for that deployment. It was really just going to be Alpha Company. And uh, because of what happened in Fallujah in the first, you know, what they call the first Fallujah, um, first tanks had to send two companies, um, you know, one after the other. So that, that sent the demand signal back to second tanks that would, we would be deploying two tank companies, in fact. Uh, so myself, along with uh, Chris Myers, who had Alpha Company, uh, were designated to go. And, um, me just arrived in second tanks. I really only had about two and a half months uh, to prepare myself and prepare to prepare the company uh, to go into a situation that we knew was going to be highly kinetic from the get go. Uh, and, um, you know, I'm sure, you know, talking to Gunny Jules and some of these other guys that were in Charlie company, I'm sure they attested to the fact that uh, the training was, was fast and furious and, and rather intense. And uh, we also weren't quite sure if we were going to do a 100% pure tank company mission. Uh, so uh, we were getting reports from the two companies in, uh, from first tanks that were in uh, Fallujah that they were actually doing a lot of the dismounted infantry type of uh, operations and missions. So um, it was on me uh, and, and the staff and COs to figure out how we, we could train the company to, to cover the entire range of expected missions. Um, so uh, fortunately for me, all three gunnies were, were master gunners. Uh, Lieutenant Smithley was uh, highly experienced, and, and we had a, had a great first sergeant, first sergeant Gary Buck, who was an infantryman, who also helped uh, bring kind of that infantry flavor into the training package. Uh, and, and, you know, JR, we didn't have PTP back then, so this was still before the PTP era, and uh, it really was up to uh, the creative uh, training uh, development uh, that the company could come up with. So, like I said, very intense. Um, you know, we didn't have a whole lot of weekends uh, knowing we were, you know, we had to train. Um, and, uh, and I have to tell you to give credit to the company. They took it seriously. Uh, they wanted to train, they wanted to be ready because they wanted to, to have a good chance to come back, yes, sir. you know? So that's, that's what drove us. Uh, and, um, and thank God that we, uh, we did train intensely and for a, 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 you know, an efficient period of time before we departed in early September. So it's my opinion that operation Phantom Fury kind of, gave the identity to Marine Corps tankers that we currently have and, and subsequently will, you know, divest knowing, uh, because when I came in, you know, that, that was the mission that was, that was very paramount and, and for many reasons, uh, one, because, you know, I, I'm speaking to the choir here, but one, because Marine Corps tankers are really combat service support and, you know, in support of the infantryman, uh, that rifleman, that grunt. And, uh, going back to, you know, what I learned early on from the Vietnam interviews is that, you know, those tankers were used in multiple capacities. Some were used as maneuver forces, some were used as combat server support. And, and there was really the, the beginnings of what kind of came to fruition as tank infantry integration. But in my opinion, it wasn't really until you all did it in Phantom 
that that tank infantry integration became so paramount, so important. And then it was really the 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 driving force for hell you call it the next 10 years because we knew that we were supporting the infantry. Did you did you understand that mission when you were when you were commanding the company and did you did you really take it? You know, I, I know you said you had the intel coming back from from, from the guys who were out in the first, thanks for the first push. But did you understand how important that was ultimately going to become? Yeah, it was uh, it was very uh, apparent uh, pretty pretty soon after arrival. Uh, you know, because when we got there, um, a lot of the infantry battalions are also rotating in fresh, uh, coming in basically the same time we came in. So third battalion, first marine, and third battalion, fifth marines, who we would end up working with uh, primarily, uh, at least in the first part of uh, Phantom Fury. And um, very quickly, uh, you know, I was expected to uh, advise the regimental uh, commander, RCT-1 commander, Colonel Shupp, who interestingly uh, is an Amtrak. Mm. A lot of people don't know that. I think he might be the only Amtrak officer to command a regiment. Mm. Uh, and and yeah. he did it phenomenally. So uh, here was a guy that, you know, also had a very good idea on how he was going to integrate uh, armor mm. into his regiment. Uh, so uh, as his principal armor advisor, um, uh, you know, we, we, we did a lot of planning pretty, pretty early, uh, knowing that uh, it was very possible we were going to have to go into the city um, and, and basically clear that city, you know, completely. Uh, so, yeah, we did know that. And uh, we also had terrific infantry battalions. Uh, the battalion commander is very receptive uh, to all of the, uh, the tank commanders. Um, and, um, you know, we were able to put together a very robust training package for about, about a one week period uh, where it was really just five full days of tank infantry integration training. Uh, and then even before we, we were actually doing that on the ground, uh, we had come up with a, a handbook, if you will, kind of a, a hodgepodge. We took some things from uh, Mike Skaggs and, and uh, Stefan Sneed and the two company commanders uh, before us. Uh, we just kind of built on that. We put together a smart pack that I think eventually ended up becoming a um, uh, a training manual that uh, Colonel John Lauder produced uh, not too long after Phantom Fury. But anyway, um, so we had kind of a, the crawl, walk, run. We had a you know, classroom uh, uh, application, and then we did a, a lot of rehearsals, both 3-1 and 3-5 in particular. So, yeah, we did know it was going to be uh, highly integrated. Uh, that, that tank infantry integration was a phrase that everybody was using uh, at that time. And uh, we also knew that, um, you know, eventually we found out that uh, the Army was going to send at least two tank companies in addition to uh, us and Alpha Company. And um, they did not have the benefit of doing that type of integration that we did. They just didn't have the time. And, and they certainly uh, weren't using those tactics uh, in their thunder runs in, um, in, the, in their previous assaults in, in, throughout Iraq. Sir. Sure. And, and I find it interesting that the Army will not break below, below platoon level. Um, and, uh, and you all were doing that pretty regularly, at least on the section level yeah, and, definitely and, having, the section. and having Gunny Jules as, as my four, uh, I was, I was the three gunner when we, when we went the second time and he, he did a back to back after Phantom, you know, mm -hmm. he already had that resident knowledge and he was uh, kind of able to say, Hey, you know, yes, I'm going to follow you, but there are going to be times where we may be on different streets, but so long as we can maintain audio and visual, you know, through the radios communication yeah. and, and, you know, I can control this section, we're going to operate like that. Uh, those those were very valuable lessons. I think you guys learned, you know, kind of on the fly. Was that something that that you had thought about also prior to uh, to this execution, sir? Yeah, it was, and um, I really had um, only two flat ass rules. You know, trying to steal that phrase from General Mattis uh, that I try to impart to the uh, to the platoons, and that was to uh, never split up the wingman. Mm -hmm. um, you know, at least be in a position to be mutually supportive. Uh, whether you're, you know, one street over uh, on the fighting on the same axis uh, in positive comms. Uh, and the second one was to uh, never leave your uh, protected infantry envelope. So we didn't want, you know, tank sections to push out uh, too far forward of the infantry. Uh, as you know, in that environment, your flanks, your top side and your rear is exposed. And, and, and that's where we're most vulnerable. So I can tell you that uh, with those two rules, uh, the, the tank company did phenomenally. Uh, the sections, uh, they fought uh, with those two, uh, those two flat ass rules, if you will. Uh, and, and they really uh, maximized, took the fight to the enemy. So I was very, very, very proud of them. What other memories you have from, from this time, sir? Uh, just, uh, you know, uh, just the fact that we broke down a section level and, and you had, uh, you know, uh, staff and COs and young uh, lieutenant platoon commanders uh, making big decisions uh, and uh, just operating off camp commander's intent and knowing 
uh, how valuable and critical they were to the infantry uh, for their survival, uh, number one, uh, and number two, for, the, uh, for clearing out the enemy. So th those are my memories of that. Uh, and also just the, uh, the bravery that we saw with the infantry. Um, you know, oftentimes we would see the, the lead fire team going into a strong point of building uh, and, and some of those guys not making it. And, and the, uh, the grunts uh, never wavered. And, and, you know, just to see that up close and personal is just an image you just can't forget. And, um, you know, your respect for what they do is just through the roof. Uh, but I can say that uh, as tankers, we did everything we could, uh, at least in, in Charlie Company and certainly Alpha Company, uh, to, to give the infantry everything we had. Uh, so those are my memories. Uh, you know, just the TTPs, the ta tactics, uh, techniques, and procedures that were developed, you know, like you said, almost on the fly, um, and, and some of the innovations that came out of it. Gunny Hillard, uh, you know, I remember uh, was, uh, you know, early on in the battle, suggested we remove the loaders 240s. You know, because, you know, quite frankly, in that environment, it's, it's not really a uh, useful weapon. Mm -hmm. uh, and in fact, um, you know, it kind of hinders a loader from employing his rifle if he's in hull defilade and he's he's trying to, you know, take a little cover inside the tank. But it, he's also able to manipulate his rifle uh, into those areas that are elevated, you know, in high, you know, high floor buildings uh, to keep us protected. Uh, and then the other thing uh, that I thought uh, about uh, Hiller's idea is you could slew the, the TC-50 cal over the left side of the tank if needed um, and um, engage targets that way if you need. And in a lot of cases, we had to do that. So uh, those kinds of, uh, you know, innovations. Um, I had a welder who was fantastic. Uh, he, um, he was able to outfit a couple of our tanks with some, um, some uh, scrap iron that he, would, he uh, welded and strapped onto the front of the tanks so we could use it as a breaching tool. Uh, you'll see in a lot of pictures uh, from Fallujah, you know, all those rubber, um, fenders are either shot off or just completely you know blown off and uh so that was a pretty good uh, little innovation uh, that we got from the uh, from the welder he had some other ideas uh, not necessarily with m1a1 tanks but he uh he helped us up up armor our sopskin humvees mm -hmm. and it was so innovative and, and he had a, a, a template on how to do it that I had to loan them out to some of the infantry time so that they could uh, you know he could help them out as well Right. You know, back then, we didn't have very many upper armored Humvees, so uh, he, his skill was in high demand. Hmm. Uh, and there were some other innovations um, that, uh, you know, like the radios, uh, you, know, the, you know, the grunts sometimes wouldn't do the crypto changeover hmm. when they were supposed to. So we learned the hard way that, you know, hey, let's, let's just fill, you know, three of our channels and then leave the other three with the, with the previous uh, crypto just so we can maintain communications. And that was certainly a good idea. Uh, and there were some other other uh, ideas that we tried and tested. Uh, one time I, uh, I had one of the infantry company commanders try to command and control his rifle company while loading in my tank because his comms were so problematic, especially when you're going to those buildings and you're trying to use squad radios. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it was actually a pretty good idea, but it's kind of towards the tail end of the kinetic fight. So uh, we weren't able to really develop that too much after that. Uh, but just those kinds of ideas. And also close your doghouse doors when you're, when you're dropping danger clothes with big swing casts. Um, <laughs> we, uh, we had one of our crews learn that the hard way uh, and, and, and blow out his sights when, when that happened. That's pretty close. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Moving on, uh, 2006, 2009. Um, at this time, uh, you were a captain, correct, sir? Uh, when you commanded, when you uh, completed joint assignment as intelligence officer with the uh, Joint Task Force North Fort Bliss, Texas. Yeah, so uh, after my time at Second Tanks, uh, went out to Fort Bliss, Texas, and El Paso, and went back to the Intelligence MOS. Um, and, and so that was, uh, again, I, I was surprised that the, the Marine Corps was uh, holding to form on the agreement mm. uh, to let me do that. And uh, uh, it was a, a three years of, of being really outside my comfort zone and working with a lot of the three-letter agencies uh, in law enforcement. Uh, some of the federal uh, agencies, uh, mostly along the southwest border, but uh, I had operations on both the uh, Canadian border and the uh, U.S.-Mexico border as well. Sure. Um, I would say the closest partner uh, that, that I worked with ended up being the FBI, which typically for JTF North, uh, that was not usual. It was usually uh, Customs and Border Protection uh, or uh, Border Patrol and the Coast Guard. But um, when I got there, uh, we started doing, the organization started working more with uh, the uh, FBI, and that is, you know, that's primarily because of the post 9-11 environment where mm. uh, the terrorist, the, the transnational uh, type of terrorist threat was more uh, of a threat than uh, just drugs. Sure. And then uh, 
Your next assignment, you came back to Second Tanks at this time from 2010, 2013, where you served as a battalion executive officer. And I'm fairly certain that your S2 shop was uh, rather, rather robust and certainly uh, well equipped, having uh, been both a tanker and an intelligence officer. Uh, but in all seriousness, as the XO, uh, you, you deployed twice here. First is a CJ-5, uh, which is a campaign planner with the ISAF Joint Command in Afghanistan. And then later as a J-5 in Somalia. So two very different theaters, one similar mission, but uh, like I said, very different in nature. Um, how do you think, you know, you, Colonel Bodish, was, were well prepared, you know, having that tank and then if, that uh, intelligence background to go out and do these, these executions? Yeah, you know, as, uh, as great as that, experience was uh, having the intelligence uh, training in MLS, I would say that uh, it was my uh, background as a tanker uh, that prepared me better uh, for, uh, for those jobs. Uh, you know, you mentioned the first one, I went back to Afghanistan uh, as a, a campaign planner for IJC, ISAF Joint Command. And uh, really, um, uh, it was a primarily a, an operational planning billet. So, um, you know, that was also uh, around the same time that the Marine Corps uh, was the first to get uh, tanks into Afghanistan. Uh, you know, the U.S. Army was trying desperately to do the same thing, uh, but they just couldn't uh, formulate their, uh, they couldn't make a compelling case with their request for forces uh, that the Marine Corps did. Um, so um, just because of that reason, and because I was the only Marine in the uh, entire J-5 section, everybody else is an Army SAMS planner, uh, the uh, RC Southwest, which is uh, the Regional Command Southwest that the Marine Corps uh, was in charge of back in those days. They put that kind of under my planning portfolio. Uh, and because I did have the Intel background, they also um, asked me to uh, uh, manage and coordinate um, all of the uh, UAS capabilities at that time, ISR capabilities, uh, and then also the uh, Afghan hands. Uh, so it was my responsibility to uh, plan and, and uh, plan the distribution of those, uh, those kind of assets throughout the theater. Uh, but interestingly, you know, um, when I when I arrived in Afghanistan uh, as a planner, I think it was just a month after I got there that uh, the three star General Rodriguez sent me uh, back to CENTCOM uh, to brief the leadership there on the campaign plan at that at that time. Mm -hmm. And then um, after I made that pit stop there, I, I went to to El Salvador, <laughs> of all places, all the way from Afghanistan, and I was asked to um, you know help. Uh, make a pitch to the, uh, the military of El Salvador to join the coalition. Uh, so it was very interesting. It was, you know, it, talk about a small world. When I went to the embassy in El Salvador, I bumped into uh, Mike Jones, you know, <laughs> a tanker, right? And right. Uh, just everywhere you go, you're going to have a tanker reunion. So it, it was one of those moments of, you know, what are you doing here? You know, both of us asking the same question. Uh, but anyway, um, so Afghanistan was a, was a uh, interesting tour. It was a uh, definitely a planner billet where, you know, I, I rarely saw the sunlight uh, and, and barely had time to PT, sleep and eat. It was an it was an 18 hour, you know, uh, you know, day work day, pretty much the whole time I was there. Um, and, and I wasn't the only one deployed. I mean, back in those days in TUMEF, if you were a field grade officer and if your battalion was not deployed as a battalion, you were going to get launched as an IA. Mm -hmm. So, you know, uh, they were only allowing one uh, field grade officer to remain back with the tank battalion. Even Lieutenant Colonel Shari, he was the battalion commander at the time. You know, he he was he was deployed. I think over nine, ten months out of his entire battalion command time. Uh, so those were very tough days, and um, you know, those were just the dues we had to pay. Uh, but you know, amazingly, the uh, the battalion kept running mm -hmm. and, and kept training and kept force generating the mu platoons, and then pretty soon we were you know, sending, as you know, the tank companies back over as tank companies mm -hmm. and route clearance companies. So uh, the pace never slowed down. And despite a, um, you know, a lack of leadership, uh, the staff and COs and the company grade had to step up and, and they did. So, you know, you can be, we can be very proud of the community for that. And then you mentioned the second deployment going to, I was actually Djibouti. I was at the Coalition Joint Task Force, Horn of Africa, mm -hmm. uh, and I was the uh, Somalia planner. Um, and, and it looked like for a while I was going to be the first, um, you know, uh, U.S. service member to get into Somalia. Uh, but unfortunately, um, I, uh, I had to leave a little bit early. I got a blood clot. So it, it forced me to leave uh, a few uh, weeks before my time was over there. And so the guy that replaced me, of course, he gets to go straight into Mogadishu uh, to do the mission there. Uh, but yeah, another interesting mission set and dealing again with uh, the VEO, the violent extremist organization uh, kind of problem uh, and trying to uh, best plan with the, with limited resources. And that that kind of characterized a lot of, uh, you know, my deployments and, and experiences abroad 
you know, you know, dealing with very complex problems and knowing we had limited resources and how, how do we make the best of it? So I think that's uh, what tankers do best. We're used to that, you know, and, and uh, we're resourceful. And, and I think, uh, you know, anybody uh, with that kind of experience, uh, I think uh, could have pulled those kind of jobs off with, with no problem. But, but you did, sir, and you did it really well. And, and I, I'll ask you a personal question. Having been in Afghanistan in 01, and then subsequently going back, you know, almost 10 years later, actually 10 plus years later, you know, what, what similarities and, and what were the stark differences be, between the theater at that point? I think it was the, uh, the mindset of the, not only uh, U.S. forces, but coalition forces. You know, it was more of an austere uh, special operations type of fight uh, early on uh, in the first few years of Afghanistan. It certainly, um, you know, when Iraq kicked up, uh, Afghanistan was, was not the focus. It was not the focus of effort. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then I would say kind of around the time frame I was there when General Petraeus uh, became the four star commanding general, uh, you know, the surge was already completed in Iraq. So now they were trying to replicate that and do a surge in Afghanistan. So really, it was the mindset of uh, what the U.S. forces uh, kind of footprint was going to look like much bigger, a lot more combat power. Now you've got tanks, you've got all this conventional, you know, kind of combat power where you didn't really have that in the early days. Uh, so those are kind of the biggest differences. And and to be honest, with you, you know. <laughs> When I was there, uh, I was I was working in a five. So, you know, I, my weapon was a computer, <laughs> you know, and uh, there's only a couple of times that I got down to uh, Helmand province mm -hmm. and uh, the living conditions and, and, uh, and, the, and the things that Marines were doing in more austere locations was a was a far different experience than, the, than what I had. Sure. So I was 13 to 14. Uh, you were assigned now to the Sea Basic Integration Division at Marine Corps uh, Combat Development Command, McCidic in Quantico, Virginia. Um, and uh, I know that this is actually stuff that we're doing right now, so I'll be sensitive with, with how I kind of phrase some of these things, but um, where where do you think we are going uh, with, the, with the efforts that you did, uh, you know, seven years ago? Um, are you seeing those now kind of come to fruition? Yeah, some of, some of those things that I've worked on, um, so being in the Sea Basin Integration Division, uh, and I was only there for a year before I got, you know, <laughs> selected for command and you know, turned right around. But in that in that short year that I was there, uh, I inherited the uh, Service Connector portfolio. So, you know, back then we only had LCACs and, and LCUs, uh, but we could see uh, even with uh, EF twenty one Expeditionary Force twenty one was kind of the uh, the emerging uh, future draft doctrine of uh, you know fighting distributed. Uh, they, you know, there's talk of, you know, employing company landing teams. It really kind of was the, uh, I think, the forefront of what we're, we're seeing now with uh, expeditionary advanced base operations. Uh, but in that, in those days, uh, we realized very quickly that the LCU and the LCAC as our service connectors was just not going to cut it. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, uh, one of the more interesting tasks that I had was uh, my uh, task for my GS-15 um, civilian equivalent to a, basically a full colonel, my section head was to put together a connector summit. And he wanted me to, to find a way to bring industry, academics, mm. theorists, practitioners from, from you know, across the industry and DOD and all the other joint services uh, to talk about what a future connector might look like. And, mm. and I thought it was a pretty innovative way to, uh, to try, try to uh, get more expertise into the conversation and just be able to kind of inform uh, the McSidic enterprise on what is in the art of possible. So some of the things that uh, the uh, these industrialists came up with as far as ideas for connectors were pretty amazing. Uh, there was something called the U-Hack, and I don't know, I can't remember what the acronym stands for now, but it was basically a, 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 a tracked vehicle that had tracks made of uh, foam, styrofoam. And uh, in, in their kind of one third scale model that they built, they believed they could transport up to two main battle tanks in one of these connectors. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, the speed would be uh, over 20 knots in the water and wow. uh, probably 15 miles an hour over land. And, it, and this, the concept that they built could, could really navigate over any terrain. And it was uh, tested over uh, coral and uh, some pretty steep gradients. It was actually a pretty uh, interesting idea. There were some other interesting ideas. There was a uh, concept of a, a folding uh, landing craft utility boat where mm -hmm. uh, it was folded up in the well deck. And then when you pushed it out into the water, it would unfold and get on plane and, and get the speed that you needed to get combat power ashore. So they had a lot of these ideas. And I think 
some of these ideas might be uh, gaining a little more traction for future connectors as they start discussing EABO, Expeditionary Advanced Base Operations, uh, for the future. So it was kind of neat to be at the forefront of that. And they're still talking about some of the same things, you know, that we were working on back then. It was also, uh, you know, pretty interesting being in uh, the uh, Combat Development Command at that time because the ACV, the Armored you know, Combat Vehicle, was just being talked about. And uh, one of my peers, uh, now Colonel Lee Rush, was uh, working at PPO, and uh, he was asked to uh, help kind of head those efforts, the development efforts. But being in the chop chain, I was able to see the trap employment manuals and how they were looking at uh, the ACV as a future AAV replacement. And, and it was interesting because back in those days, there was a struggle as far as determining, is this, is this thing going to be an infantry fighting vehicle or is it going to just be a troop transport? And, um, you know, I'm not so sure uh, what direction they're actually going to go with uh, this ACV when they finally field it. Uh, but it is a wheeled vehicle. And there was a lot of people in the building that were, were convinced uh, that wheeled vehicle technology, even seven years ago, was at a point that it would exceed uh, the uh, performance characteristics of a track vehicle. So mm. now you're seeing, you know, with the divestment of the tank battalions uh, and, uh, you know, I think you're going to see a rapid uh, demise of the AAV, the, uh, Am, you know, uh, Amtrak. Uh, pretty soon, we're really not going to have many track vehicles left in the Marine Corps. It's all going to be a wheeled uh, vehicle portfolio. Yes, sir. Uh, and uh, I got to see that firsthand uh, out in San Diego working on the ACV as well. So yeah, mm -hmm. I absolutely uh, uh, concur 100% with what you're saying. And you'd mentioned the divestment. And uh, obviously, this week is a very tough week, uh, particularly for somebody like yourself who served as commanding officer for 2nd Tank Battalion in 2014-16. to 16. Um, And uh, sir, what, what are some of your, some of your memories as, as uh, commander of 2nd Tanks? So, uh, you know, again, I was very excited to, to get back to second tanks uh, as a CO. Um, and, you know, I'm not sure how many officers actually get to do three tours in the same battalion. I'm sure there's not that many. I know staff and COs, it's a different story. Uh, but it was uh, exciting for sure. And, um, and I, I found, you know, realized pretty early uh, that I was seeing the future of our community uh, when I think my first year in command, uh, I was directed to uh, divest uh, the scout platoon, the tow platoon, and Delta Company, and uh, you know what? You know, kind of a, a flub, if you will, on my part. When uh, we divested the uh, Delta Company and scouts and tows, we did it. We we put the information out, um, and uh, but I don't think we broadcasted it uh, to the extent that it deserved. You know, uh, one I didn't ha I didn't have a whole lot of time. I was kind of you know, that, those, those, those three formations had to divest quickly. Uh, and then we had, I was just directed to divest a second tank company in the next FY. So uh, we didn't have a whole lot of time, but I will say that even with the lack of time uh, and really only being able to advertise it on Facebook back then, uh, we still had probably 300 people show up uh, to, to the divestment of, the, of Delta Company, Toes and Scouts. And uh, surprisingly, uh, out of, of that 300, we had quite a few uh, infantry Marines that had served in to toes and scouts from, you know, 30, 30 years prior. Uh, and, uh, you know, that's when I realized that this is a very, very proud outfit. Uh, the O3 XXs that served in tank battalions. Uh, and we've all known that before, you know, they're very proud to be in the, in the, in the, in the tank battalions. So uh, based on that reaction, I was committed to putting a mark on, on the deck for a divestment of Charlie company and getting that word out uh, much quicker and making it a much bigger deal, you know, having the general officer, you know, invited uh, uh, to the ceremony and much like what we saw with uh, the tank battalion this week, we made it a much, a much bigger deal and, and we were better for it. So uh, we didn't repeat that, 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 that mistake the next year. Uh, we did Charlie company. I think it was about 400 people that showed up. We had a, we had to do it in the field house uh, because there were so many people expected to attend. And I think we must've had six or seven uh, prior Charlie Company commanders, and, and many of them were Lieutenant Colonels, Colonels, and retired Colonels that showed up. So it was a, a real emotional event, and, uh, and I think it might have been a, a good template for what we saw with uh, Lieutenant Colonel Matt Dowden and the divestment of the time this week. Yes, sir. I can cover entirely. Um, and uh, having spent time there, um, both as, as, as a, a enlisted Marine and then uh, coming back there just recently, it was it was very heart wrenching and, and like you said, it, it was done very very well. And the honor that was bestowed upon the battalion, you know, past, present, 
you know, was, was just phenomenal. Um, looking around that room at times and seeing the history that was just there, uh, yeah. just really spoke to who Second Tanks is and, you know, 79 years of history. Absolutely. I mean, it's, it's, it's just remarkable. Um, and just to have the opportunity to sit down with these gentlemen and talk to them is phenomenal. Uh, much like yourself, sir. I mean, you know, you're, you're an absolute integral part of that. And, uh, Sir, uh, like we had mentioned, you know, with the divestment of second tanks, uh, you know, there's there's things that, that you know, are going to come to fruition, you know, years from now, and, and the impacts are probably gonna be longstanding. Are there any, you know, that kind of come to your mind uh, that need to be addressed or, you know, need we need to talk about? Yeah, you know, just specific to second tank battalion, um, you know, there's a lot of relationships between the battalion uh, and uh, the fallen Marines uh, from, from, you know, past battles, especially Iraq, Afghanistan, uh, but in particular, the uh, Lakazi family uh, who established the Ace in the Hole Foundation. Obviously, they named it after, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the slogan of Second Tank Battalion, uh, but they named the foundation after uh, their son, Lieutenant Lakazi, who was a platoon commander, uh, who was lost along with his three uh, tank crewmen uh, in near Karma, Iraq, um, you know, in the, in, in the early years, I think it was around 2005, if I'm not mistaken. And, um, or actually it was 2006. Uh, so we lost all four of those crewmen, uh, in, in a, in a tragic accident, uh, in Iraq. And, uh, they established, uh, a, 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 a scholarship fund, if you will. Uh, and they were able to su successfully link up with the Marine Corps Tanker Association and, um, put these, uh, donated funds into the Tanker Association scholarship. So they've, they have funded probably uh, tens of thousands of dollars over the years uh, to uh, the dependents of second, second tanks, uh, really the tank community uh, seeking, you know, higher education. Uh, so I'm worried about, you know, losing those linkages, uh, very special family. Uh, they've done a lot of special things for, for, uh, for members of the tank community. And then there's probably other uh, organizations that we have to think about the Marine Corps Tanker Association, uh, you know, the Vietnam Tanker Association is also a very robust organization. And that's just, you know, coming from second tanks and then, you know, multiply that across the whole community uh, and these uh, other linkages. I'm really concerned about that. Um, and I'm also, you know, you know, kind of our younger generation, uh, Marines that have served more recently, uh, you know, the tank community is very proud. Uh, and, and it's been on display with all these uh, divestment ceremonies, deactivation ceremonies from the companies now to these battalions. And, um, you know, I just hope... Uh, you know, we can find ways uh, to make reunions, uh, to keep that community together, because I think it's important for all of us uh, that we be that we're thinking about each other, thinking about uh, and be proud of our contributions to the Marine Corps uh, in the future. Yes, sir. Thank you for saying that. And we had talked off the air, sir, um, about your deployments and really your second one in particular and the uh, uh, the unfortunate circumstance of, of, of having, unfortunately, to, to bury um, two of our brothers. Um, are you able to, uh, to discuss those, uh, the circumstances leading up to that, sir? Yeah. So, you know, while our, our Charlie company deployment in support of, uh, Operation Phantom Fury was, was very kinetic, uh, we were very fortunate not to lose anybody. And, and you know, even today I, I look back and, and think, you know, it's amazing that we didn't, but it's really, it's a credit, uh, to, to the tankers, uh, to the Marines of the company, uh, the mechanics to keeping the tanks operating in the fight. And all the supportive voices that it takes to, to run a tank company, uh, but you know, not too long after uh, returning uh, from Iraq, Phantom Fury, uh, some of our brothers that were in that company, you know, we we lost a few of them over the years. Uh, two of them in particular, uh, Sergeant Uloa, uh, we lost him in a subsequent deployment, uh, and uh, you know, it, it, it was one of those that hurt your heart because he was such a great Marine, um, and uh, and I know uh, Gunny Jules was very close to him, having having been in the same turret with that Marine in, in Phantom Fury. Uh, and I remember, um, you know, at the at the time of his death, I'd already PCS from Second Tanks and was working at JTF North. Uh, the battalion commander at the time, uh, Colonel Bianca, asked if I could, uh, you know, represent the battalion uh, and uh, go back to my hometown where Sergeant Lowe was from. Uh, and, and attend the ceremony and present um, the American flag to uh, his widow. Um, uh, very difficult, but I can tell you, uh, Gunny Jules was there. He flew there as well, met me there. And, you know, to have him and, and some other Marines uh, that joined us uh, uh, was, was, uh, was uh, something very special and, and uh, kind of helped all of us, I think, get through that, that grieving process. Uh, and then a few years later, while I was at the War College uh, as a student at the Naval War College, I was asked uh, by the Smithley family, 
to uh, come down and deliver the eulogy uh, for Aaron Smithley, A.C. Smithley, a.k.a. Uh, the Ox, um, who was my uh, company XO, Man of Fury. We lost him to cancer. And uh, again, uh, you know, those type of losses hurt uh, deeply. Uh, and, uh, you know, we had uh, Lieutenant Adame, uh, Lieutenant Buffamane, uh, Gunny Jules again uh, come to the funeral and uh, just kind of support each other because, uh, you know, losing brothers like that, especially at such a young age, you know, left behind five children. Uh, and he, he was a real special, special tanker, all of them were, but, you know, just to lose these guys at a young age uh, really hurts deep. Uh, so, you know, yeah, really tough, uh, tough experiences, um, uh, you know, but, you know, that's kind of how things go. May they rest, sir. Uh, moving on, though, um, talking about your next assignment when you graduated the Naval War College in Newport, Rhode Island. This time with, uh, with in my accountant here, your second master's degree, uh, this one in national security and st uh, strategic studies. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, from uh, the War College. Uh, and then um, uh, after that, I was given a, basically given a choice, you know, stay at the Naval War College and teach or go to the Air War College and teach there. And uh, I let the wife pick that one this time. And she, she's from the South. So she, she rolled, you know, rolled the dice and it landed on uh, Alabama. So that's where we went. It was a short tour, did two years there. I uh, got selected a Colonel. Uh, so um, I moved on pretty quickly out of there in, into Okinawa uh, to work on the three MEF staff uh, as the G37. Sir. And with the uh, change to the three MEF assignments, sir, uh, what, what are you able to speak about on the channel as far as the, uh, the, the shift in, in the force design? Yeah, so, uh, you know, my timing was uh, impeccable. Like uh, a lot of my previous tours, uh, I get to uh, 3MF in uh, late June of uh, 2019. Uh, and then just a few days later, the CPG drops, the, command, the Commandant's Planning Guidance. So the Commandant's Planning Guidance, when it got published and got released, it really kind of signaled a tectonic shift, if you will, uh, for 3MF to become the focus MEF uh, of the Marine Corps. And uh, before that, as we know, one, MEF, uh, one Marine Expeditionary Force has typically and historically been uh, what we used to call the Imperial MEF, right, for many okay. years. Uh, so now it's three MEF's turn. And, um, you know, General Clarity, Lieutenant General Clarity was the MEF commander. He also uh, had arrived uh, just before I did. And uh, the MEF and the entire staff had to very quickly consume and synthesize uh, the Commons planning guidance and redesign how three MEF uh, was going to be the stand-in force, what we call uh, three MEF now. Mm -hmm. uh, being in the first island chain. So with that, part of my responsibility is the G G37. And what I can tell you as, uh, as the guy that was in charge of basically uh, all of the exercises, uh, the training and readiness uh, for 3MF um, and in line with uh, General Clarity's uh, in, you know, intent uh, was to uh, put more of a focus uh, against the, the, the pacing threat mm -hmm. that we had before. So a lot of those exercises that may not have uh, as much of a direct connection to the pacing threat, we, we either scaled down, de-scoped, or just divested and put more, put more focus into uh, the exercises that we thought were more aligned to what we had to do to prepare against the pacing threat. So those are the kinds of things I can tell you. Um, and you know the, uh, the the churn is still going on out there in 3MF. I'm still pretty close to, uh, to what's going on in that organization now in my current job. Uh, supporting the training of those units that are rotating uh, to, to the Combined Arms Training Center at Camp Fuji. Uh, but it's, uh, it really is interesting, uh, you know, being kind of witnessing that emerging history of how 3MEF is trying to modernize and transform their force uh, to prepare for the guidance that was given by the Commandant. Sir. And as a commanding officer, com Combined Arms Training Center, Camp Fuji, I do have to ask you a question, sir. So, you know, having, having come from your tanker background, how are we doing combined arms with the loss of such a such a dramatic direct fire weapon system? Yeah, so that's a, that's a really great question, and um, luckily, I've got a very close relationship with uh, a lot of the, uh, the commanders in Third Marine Division, uh, Fourth Marine Regiment Commander uh, Colonel Matt Tracy, uh, the Twelfth Marines uh, Artillery uh, Regiment uh, Commanding Officer is Colonel Mike Roach, uh, and um, I get to work very closely with them and try to help uh, design. Uh, and help plan their uh, training exercises at Camp Fuji. Uh, and you're right, how do we uh, deal with the fact that uh, we're gonna have a force structure now uh, void of tanks, but knowing that we may face a, a peer 
that does have tanks. Mm -hmm. So we emphasize to uh, a lot of the, the companies rotating through and the battalions are rotating through that they need, now need to figure out how are they going to kill tanks without tanks. Mm -hmm. uh, but more importantly, um, you know, we have uh, uh, in that first island chain scenario, we are expected to have a very close and integrated bilateral partnership with the Japanese. They still have tanks. So, you know, in the past, we have not really trained uh, in, a, in, a, in a bilateral training event or an exercise with our Japanese partners where we integrate with their tank capabilities. And now we're going to start seeing that uh, out there in 3MEF. Uh, you know, how do we kill tanks without tanks? And then how do we integrate capabilities? Uh, if we can't get army tanks right away, we might have to rely on some partner capabilities and their armor capabilities. So that's what we're going to start seeing, I think, uh, in the near future. Very interesting answer, sir, and one that I certainly did not expect, and I appreciate you providing that. Mm -hmm. um, and sir, uh, the channel does have a message, and and for somebody that, like I said, you know, so very close to Second Tank Battalion, you know, having been the commander as well as, you know, served their, uh, you know, in, in Operation Phantom Fury, what message do you have for the community, especially this week, um, post divestment of the armor community? Um, just want to thank uh, all the members that have come through the Iron Horse. Uh, and not just there, uh, first tanks, fourth tanks, eight tanks, all the different uh, uh, tank units uh, throughout the history of the Marine Corps. Uh, but to thank them for the sacrifice, uh, thank them for, for their leadership, uh, thank them for their dedication to the Marine Corps. You know, as we all know, our history is very colorful. It's, uh, it's, it's, um, it's highly uh, honored and respected. And I think uh, the Marine Corps as a whole uh, should be very thankful for the kinds of people, the kinds of Marines that have come through the tank battalions over the years. And really, uh, you know, as we've talked about it in Fallujah, dedicated ourselves to supporting our infantry brothers. Uh, and, and you really, you know, you can't ask much more uh, of the tank community than that. Uh, and I can certainly say, having witnessed it many, many times, um, tankers gave 100% at all times. And it's something, you know, they should be very proud of, a legacy they should be very proud of. I think going forward, uh, tankers uh, are, you know, and, and those that served in tank battalions, not just tankers, it's your mechanics, it's all the support personnel. I think you'll find, um, you know, the uh, divestments of the tank battalions have affected a lot of people from across a lot of MOSs uh, in a very similar fashion. Um, but I think going forward, um, you know, Marines that have served in these tank battalions uh, probably learn a lot of lifelong lessons that will serve them well in the future. And, you know, no matter if they stay in the Marine Corps, uh, choose another path or, uh, you know, go into the civilian world and, and, and take it on whatever uh, careers they might take on in the future. So um, that's one thing that separates uh, tanker Marines, I think, from other Marines uh, is our drive uh, and our, our, our will to, to succeed and excel. And, and so I know uh, the future is going to be bright for those folks uh, after these, uh, these divestments are completely over. Thank you for saying that, sir. Uh, I, I really appreciate that. And, and definitely the, the right message we need to hear right now, particularly timely. And uh, sir, I thank you for coming on. I know you're extremely busy. And I know that, uh, you know, traveling around the world, literally, um, you know, your, your time is very valuable. So the time you made here today, sir, I, I, I truly appreciate it. And, and your message is one that the community needs to hear right now. Um, so thank you for that. I also need to take a moment and thank the subscribers and the viewers. It's through you all that the channel maintains its momentum. And uh, if you've not already done so, please do subscribe. If you have, if you don't know how YouTube works, basically it's the number of subscriptions. The higher that rises, the more influence, the more reach that they will have, and uh, this this channel will be protected so that you know future generations can go back and watch these videos. Um, sir, like I said, thank you very much for coming on here. And uh, parting comments are yours. Yeah, Jr. Thank you for what you're doing, and uh, you know, especially. Uh, uh, with all the videos that you're, you're uh, producing and kind of capturing that history, because uh, you, you never know, we might need it down the road, who knows. Uh, but also, uh, you know, being down there in person uh, to see and attend that ceremony down there at Second Tanks and to also uh, uh, launch uh, that commemorative video that came out uh, yesterday uh, after that divestment. A very special video, I watched it and, and I can tell you, I you know even throughout this interview, my phone has been blowing up with text messages from old tankers uh, just now seeing that uh, production. So I just appreciate you and, and others trying to capture our history, uh, preserving our legacy. And I can tell you, you know, tankers know how to party. Uh, so I know we'll have reunions in the, uh, you know, in the future. And I'm looking forward to attending those uh, and celebrating uh, all the good times uh, that, uh, that our tankers should rightfully celebrate. 
Thank you, sir, for saying that. I do have to give, give a disclosure. I have very little to do with the uh, second tanks video. Um, that was that was really Master Gunner Sergeant Formella and, and of, of course Lieutenant Colonel Bowden and uh, uh, Corporal Flick and, the, and those gentlemen out there, gentlemen and ladies um, in, in Comstrat as well. So all, yeah, all I did, all I did was host it, sir. But I, I'm not going to steal any of their credit because, like you said, it's an amazing video. Uh, super proud to be able to be the the the, the channel that, that has it on there for everyone to look at. Um, but sir, I do appreciate your words, and, and it's it's been an absolute honor, you know, especially having an opportunity to sit down with somebody like yourself. Um, you know, this this channel has really proven to be, for me personally, um, a, a way of dealing with the divestment, yeah. and and just the knowledge that I've gained through these interviews and and the, and the connections made are invaluable. Um, but, but I truly do appreciate your time, sir. I appreciate you coming on here. Yeah, thank you again. I really appreciate it. Thanks. Hurrah. Hurrah.